Welcome to the Congressional Joint Hearing and Roundtable entitled Full Disclosure, What the EPA's Water Rule Means for Arizona. We have with us a full panel today and full discussion. The purpose of this hearing is to find out from members of the public and from various constituent groups uh, the impact of the proposed water rule from the EPA. Um, we have various witnesses that will be introduced as they come forward, and we have uh, various numbers of members of Congress and one state senator with us who we will introduce momentarily. But we're going to start first with our uh, invocation. Donna Kafer, are you here? There she is. Can everybody stand? Thank you, Father, for the words of the psalmist that admonishes us to serve you in gladness. For it is through you that we have our very being. It is in you that we live, move, and breathe. Give us the ability, Father, to remain grateful for, for gratitude is the key to living a life of lasting significance. Remind us today, Father, that our work is an honor, that our duties are given first to you, then to each other. Lord, give each person here today a renewed sense of purpose in service and instill in them a fresh optimism for their calling. Now, Father, I ask that you bless each one, pouring out your infallible love, mercy, and grace on them. Thank you, Father. We pray this in your perfect name and in the name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Now we will have the color guard presented by the Cub Scouts, Troop 951 from Mesa, uh, led by their den leader, Katie Eisen. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. We're now going to start with opening statements from the various members uh, who are present here today. In addition, we will have a statement read on behalf of Congressman Ron Barber uh, by Mara Salasolis uh, de Kester. Uh, but we start with the first opening statement by Congressman Paul Gosar. Good morning, everybody. We got some seats. Let's kind of tighten up so everybody gets a chance to seat. have a seat, please. And good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us. This hearing will come to order. Your engagement today reflects the spirit of Arizona and our common goal of creating a more prosperous nation. I want to thank each and every one of our witnesses for being here today and taking time out of their busy schedules. We look forward to your testimony. Also joining us today is Congresswoman Lamar Smith of Texas, who is chairman of the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee. Lamar, thanks for coming uh, to Arizona. Your participation is truly uh, appreciated. I also want to give a special thanks to uh, Congressman Swikert and his staff for joining us uh, in, in getting this uh, event organized. So thank you, David, very much. 
I want to also thank all my other colleagues on the dais for taking time to attend this hearing as we closely examine the recent proposed rule released by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, or e uh, EPA, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, known as the Corps of Ar Engineers, which seeks to expand the definition of the navigable water of the United States. I will note that the entire Arizona delegation was invited to participate in, in the hearing. While none of the members on the other side of the aisle chose to participate in person, I am pleased that Congressman Ron Barber recognized the importance of this hearing and sent his district director, uh, Maricela Solis, to read a statement on his behalf. So thank you for attending today, Maricela, and we look forward to Representative Barber's statement. I would also note that witnesses were invited to participate from the EPA and the Corps of Engineers. Deplorably, both agencies declined to send a representative. Their absence is unfortunate for a variety of reasons. All too often, bureaucrats in Washington fail to consider the potential negative consequences of, of these very regulations they put forth by their respective agencies. In hopes to remedy this neglect, Congress passed the Regulatory Flexibility Act to ensure that federal agencies meet certain obligations and consider the economic impact of any new regulation and how it will have an effect on small businesses and our economy. Unfortunately, compliance with the Regulatory Flexibility Act has all too often been the exemption, exception rather than the rule, and few agencies are worse at compliance with this law than the EPA. On March 25, 2014, the EPA and the Corps of Engineers released a proposed rule that would assert Clean Water Act jurisdiction over nearly all areas with even the slightest of connections to water resources, including man-made conveyances. So once again, we find ourselves at the crossroad of a federal government overreach and overburdened Americans struggling to stay afloat in this ocean of bureaucracy. This rule, as currently written, will broaden the regulatory reach of the EPA and the Clean Water Act to thousands of small ditches, ponds, and other isolated waters, some of which have little or no previous connection to, to traditionally navigable waters under the control of the federal government. Despite the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court has previously heard two separate cases on this topic and determined that the EPA has no legal authority to expand the definition of navigable water under the Clean Water Act, the EPA is falsely claiming that this new rule will increase clarity as to which waters are subject to Clean Water Act jurisdiction. Let me be clear, nothing could be further from the truth. This proposed water grab runs contrary to state and tribal water laws and would have devastating economic consequences for farmers, ranchers, small businesses, and water users in Arizona and throughout the country. This would impact everything from local governments trying to expand infrastructure projects to the construction of community gardens and undermines the constitutional role of Congress, not the EPA, as the lawmaking body of the United States. What makes this proposed rule even worse is the lack of accountability from the EPA and the Corps of Engineers and their research for proposing this new law. According to a recent report by economist and University of California Berkeley faculty member David Sundling, the Environmental Protection Agency's uh, proposed Clean Water Act rule is rife with errors and lack of, lacks transparency. Dr. Sandling goes on to document how the EPA excluded costs under represented jurisdictional areas and used flawed methodology to arrive at a much lower economic cost of the proposed rule. Dr. Sunding concluded that the errors in the EPA's analysis are so extensive that it should be rendered useless for determining the true cost of this proposed rule. His report underscores the need for the EPA to withdraw the rule and complete a comprehensive and transparent economic review that complies with federal law. As we will hear today, administrative applications and regulatory overreach by executive fiat are being used to seize power and control from state, tribal, and local jurisdictions. The bottom line is Arizonans can't afford more economic hurdles and the thieveries of precious water supplies from an overzealous, unaccountable federal government operating in a hyper mode. There's an old adage in the West, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting over. Rest assured that I'm committed to that fight, as are my other colleagues on this dais and the majority of the people in this room. The good news is there is widespread support in Congress for rolling back this overreach. 230 of my colleagues and I recently demanded the EPA and the Corps of Engineers immediately withdraw this flawed rule. I look forward to hearing from the witnesses today and gathering a local perspective with regard to potential impacts associated with the proposed rule for the citizens of Arizona. And with that, it gives me a great pleasure to yield to my friend and my colleague, Congressman Lamar Smith, for his opening statement. Lamar, once again, thanks for coming to Arizona for your trip. The floor is all yours.
Paul, thank you for that introduction, and thank you for including me at today's uh, roundtable discussion about a very, very important subject. And I want to say to everyone here, it's just a distinct pleasure for me to be with so many outstanding colleagues. Uh, David Swikert to my left, Paul Gosar who just introduced me, Matt Salmon, and Trent Franks are all uh, just special friends and all, as I say, outstanding members of Congress, and I'm always privileged to be in their company. Uh, I also want to mention a connection that I have uh, to your great state. I know you're infiltrated uh, quite frequently by Texans, uh, but in the case of my my family, my uncle, uh, Uncle Mac McDonald Smith, was a professor at Arizona State University for many, many years uh, before I admit uh, moving to the University of Texas in Austin. Uh, so uh, I uh, cross bridges with both states in, in that regard. Uh, one thing I remember about visiting Uncle Mac uh, years and years ago, and I'd never seen it before, sort of a natural phenomenon as far as I was concerned, and that is he used to water his yard by flooding it. Uh, and I think that only occurs in Arizona, and it probably only occurs many, many years ago, but it was an uh, indelible memory that I have from that particular uh, time. Uh, and let me get to my opening statement and say again uh, to you all, thank you for attending, thank you for your interest in the subject, and uh, thank you for helping us try to, I hope, restrain the unnecessary and burdensome regulations that are oftentimes promulgated uh, by this administration. Uh, several hours ago, the administration announced costly climate regulations under the Clean Air Act. Behind the flashy rollout, there's nothing new. It's all pain and no gain. EPA mandates will hit struggling workers and families the hardest. The Chamber of Commerce says these rules could kill hundreds of thousands of jobs and cost $50 billion every year. The, this administration is simply out of control. The EPA's proposed Waters of the U.S. rule under the Clean Water Act, which is what we're discussing here today, is yet another example of an agency driven by partisan politics instead of sound science. When the EPA unveiled this rule, Administrator McCarthy claimed that it will, quote, save us time, keep money in our pockets, cut red tape, and give certainty to business. But I haven't heard one farmer or small business owner who agrees the only certainty is an agency that is undertaking one of the largest expansions of federal power in our nation's history. In its rush to implement the President's radical agenda, the EPA published this new rule without even waiting for expert advice. The Science Advisory Board exists to provide independent advice to the EPA and Congress. It is the job of these experts to review the underlying science. But either EPA doesn't care what the scientific advisors have to say, or they are worried that the experts don't agree with them. Not only did the EPA publish its rule before the advisory board's report was completed, but the agency also prevented the science advisory board from responding to questions from members of Congress. What is the EPA trying to hide? The Obama administration continues to undermine scientific integrity in order to fast-track a partisan regulatory agenda. However, the law that establishes the Science Advisory Board and the EPA's own policies require expert review. Giving science advisors a chance to influence EPA decisions isn't just a good idea. It happens to be the law. But the EPA didn't want to wait for that scientific advice. Instead, the EPA wrote itself a blank check. The rule is so vague that the EPA can claim authority over just about anywhere wet enough to breed mosquitoes. Is the EPA going to claim someone's backyard pond? This mosquito rule may go even farther than that. In the pages upon pages of definitions, the one thing EPA fails to define is water. This is where the rule gets tricky. The sole purpose of the rule was to clearly define waters of the U.S., but it never actually defines waters. The rule defines broad tracts of land as riparian areas and seems to look for little more than a rainstorm to trigger federal control. Let me show you a map EPA is considering, and it's on the screen to my right here. This is a map from EPA's draft report showing tributaries in red and blue that the EPA is considering claiming in the West. As you can see, the red area is almost 99 percent of the land that would be impacted. The Clean Water Act was supposed to be about water, but not land. Common sense tells you that if it's not wet, it's not water. 
The American people didn't ask the EPA to invade their backyards, yet that may be what they're getting. It's time to put a stop to the EPA's overreach and to protect the private property of all Americans. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. And our next uh, uh, opening statement is from Senator Gail Griffin, who is uh, chairman of the Water, Land, and Rural Development Committee for the uh, State Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Franks, Salmon, Gosart, Swigert. Special thank you for Congressman Smith for making his trip and honored guests. My name is Gail Griffin. I am a state senator representing District 14, which includes all of Cochise County, all of Greenlee County, most of Graham County and the eastern portion of uh, Pima County. These counties are some of the most rural areas of the states and the residents of these counties are ranchers, farmers, miners, small business people and families. They along with millions of other Americans are deeply concerned with this rule and its potential impact on the lives and their livelihood. It's for this reason that I'm proud to be standing with you in opposition to this proposed rule. As I'm sure you'll hear by others today, the EPA's proposed rule is nothing less than an unlawful expansion of federal regulation over routine farming, ranching practices, as well as other common private land uses such as home building. The rule is contrary to the intent of the Clean Water Act and outside the scope of the EPA's authority. Congress has never authorized EPA to expand its authority over dry streams and washes and I suspect that if EPA were to try, Congress would quickly and overwhelmingly reject this request. As we all know, the proposed rule would significantly expand the scope of navigable waters and non-navigable waters subject to the Clean Water Act by jurisdiction, by regulating small and remote waters, many of which are not even wet or considered waters by any current legal definition. What's more, this rule has the potential to interfere with the process that's been underway in Arizona for many years to determine the navigability of rivers and streams throughout the state. This process we, know, we hope will be completed this year as to whether the rivers in the state were navigable at time of statehood, February 14, 1912. Does the EPA's rule override those findings? Will the EPA have control over every dry wash or stream in the state even though the state has determined them to be non-navigable. Also alarming is the fact that EPA's rule has been prepared based on a report that has not even been finalized or scientifically peer-reviewed. How can the EPA justify a rule that expands the authority over private property throughout the country based on a study that is in draft form and does not, has not been commented on by the public? The EPA should allow for public comment on the report before it proposes any rule, not after, and should suspend the current comment period and reopen it when the report is finalized and published. Why is it important for the public to review and comment on the report? Because for the first time in history, this rule would give federal regulators authority over irrigation ditches stormwater systems, roadside ditches, waters located within riparian and floodplain areas, and dry washes. All of these so-called waters, even if they don't have water in them, could be subject to EPA regulations under this proposed rule. It takes a special kind of arrogance to assert that a wash or an irrigation ditch with no water should be subject to the Clean Water Act, yet that is exactly what EPA is proposing. As a result of this rule, if adopted, everyday activities like grazing cattle, plowing a field, applying fertilizer, managing weeds, or building a home could now require a permit from the federal government. What this means is that a regulator from San Francisco or Washington, D.C. would decide whether a farmer tilling his field in rural Arizona is a threat to the water quality of a dry river. How does it benefit the people of Arizona to require property owners, farmers, ranchers, and home builders to obtain a permit for everyday activities? I have the answer. It does not. The EPA's proposed expansion of the Clean Water Act is just the latest in a series of, series of federal attacks on private property, 
water rights, natural resource industries of rural America. These federal actions have had devastating consequences for both the environment and the economy of rural Arizona, in particular, consider the following examples. The Mexican spotted owl, the extreme environmental groups to end commercial logging in the northern in northern Arizona resulted in many fires, over a million acres of forest and 500 homes destroyed. The Environmental Protection Act recently rejected the state's implementation plan for regional haze and required Arizona to comply with the federal implement implementation plan mandating that several Arizona power plants to install selected catalytic reduction equipment at the cost of nearly $1 billion. Arizona residents cannot afford to have a billion dollars taken out of their wallets for technology that will not even have visible impact on air quality. More recently, EPA threatened to require the Navajo Generating Station to install similar technology at its plant, which would have forced owners to shut down the plant. The Navajo Generating Station provides electricity for Central Arizona Project, and such a shutdown would have raised water rates for Arizona residents estimated at 15 to 20 percent. In addition, the EPA carbon rule announced this morning would have devastating effect on the economy both locally and nationwide. Arizona's economy simply can't afford that. These are just a few examples, but I could go on all day, expansion of the Mexican wolf habitat in violation of the 10J rule, designation of critical habitat of jaguars, which my home happens to be in, Objection, objections to cuckoos, garter snakes, travel management plans, wilderness area designations, and the Endangered Species Act. Each of these represent an expansion of federal regulatory authority at the expense of private property rights and state sovereignty. I feel compelled to point out that the western states like Arizona are particularly vulnerable at these regulations because the federal government's ownership of the majority of land in the western United States. How can a state thrive when primary land owners is the federal government? And I have a map, that red and white map over in the corner. What you see in white is all we have in private hands. And in your package that you have before you today, the Arizona Farm Bureau did a study back in 1997 that showed Arizona only had 13 percent of land in private ownership in Arizona. Finally, I would like to sound the alarm about a growing practice that is having ever greater consequences for our economy, and that is the federal government's implementation of new environmental and land use regulations through sue and settle agreements with extreme environmental groups. According to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, there have been 71 successful sue and settle negotiations from 2009 to 2012 that have resulted in more than 100 new federal rules carrying estimated compliance costs of more than $100 million annually. These agreements deny local governments, affected parties, members of the public a seat at the table. They also leave few opportunities to protest. It's time for Congress to rein in EPA and other federal agencies before it's too late. Federal environmental regulations are killing rural America. Arizona's economy, especially its natural resource industries, can only absorb so much. To conclude, as I have said many times before, it's a sad day when the greatest threat to America's economy comes not only from Europe and China and the Middle East, but from Washington, D.C. Thank you for your time, for being here today. We look forward to working with you and the citizens of Arizona and the United States. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Our next opening statement will come from the representative from Arizona's 5th Congressional District, Matt Salmon, who is a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Education and Workforce Committee. Thank you. Uh, Congressman Gosar, when you quoted that oft-quoted uh, <coughs> oft quotation about uh, whiskeys for drinking, waters for fighting, and you wanted to get in the fight, I'm worried the Republic's going to say tomorrow you want to get into some drunken bar fight, you know, <laughs> the way they do things, you know. Um, and Lamar, uh, Congressman Smith, just thrilled to have you out here. Thank you for 
taking the time to come out here. Uh, we really appreciate it. We're, uh, we're proud to be fighting the fight alongside our state legislators, uh, brave leaders like Gail Griffin, who've uh, tried to fight the fight for common sense. And too bad, this is not about the environment. This is about a power grab. This is about asserting uh, their authority, just like the clean air. Uh, the only way that uh, we ever come into compliance in Maricopa County, the Clean Air Act, is if we pave the desert. And they don't get that, that these rules sometimes are really silly. The Clean Water Act states that its objective is to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. This is to be accomplished by eliminating the discharge of pollutants into navigable waters. The current definition of navigable, navigable waters applies to waters of the United States, including the territorial seas. Since the Clean Water Act's inception in 1972, this definition has left businesses across the country struggling to define what does and what and does not constitute a water of the United States under the Act. Unfortunately, many court battles have been fought because of the lack of clarity provided by the current language within the Clean Water Act. Recently, the EPA proposed a new rule that we're here to talk about today and new definitions within the Clean Water Act that promise to harm small business, yet one more time, and private landowners. According to the EPA, the new rules do not expand the types of water protected under the Act, but further clarify what constitutes a navigable water of the U.S. under the law. Unfortunately, I think we all know this is not the case. The vague terms uh, used in this bill promise to subject everyday Americans to invasive, burdensome regulations that could very well crush them through lengthy court proceedings and exorbitant lit litigation costs, just like it did to the timber industry uh, here in this state. And what's the end result of that, Ben? Uh, the very thing that they're trying to do, protect the spotted owl, has made them more endangered because of the terrible wildfires that have destroyed, nearly destroyed their habitat because of the lame policies coming out of Washington, D.C. The new rule would include much smaller bodies of water that few would consider to be navigable. Maybe for my uh, grandson's uh, little toy boat, but other than that, not navigable by uh, our, our standards. These small bodies of water that the new rules would con uh, control would include local streams, river banks, wetlands, and floodplains that may have access to larger bodies of water. Additionally, the proposed rule could also prohibit ranchers and farmers from lawfully making necessary on-the-spot decisions that are essential to the success of their herd or their crops. For the first time ever, EPA is defining ditches as tributaries, which would subject private landowners to a whole new slew of complicated regulatory penalties. Here in Arizona, water is scarce, and irrigation ditches are often used to transport water from one field to the next. Under the EPA's proposal, new regulations on landowners could result in them having to purchase costly permits and face lengthy delays in order to secure permission from the federal government to conduct their own affairs on their own land. That, that's not just unreasonable, it's crazy. Furthermore, it's, co it's completely counter to the EPA's claim that these new rules do not expand federal authority. The reality of this proposed rule is that while it does modify the existing defi definition of navigable waters here in the United States, it fails to offer clarity that the EPA promised and instead expands the federal government's power to regulate even on private property. Furthermore, this continued lack of clarity will allow regulators to persist in venturing into murky territory, especially as it relates to agricultural land use and cause undue harm to American farmers, ranchers, and business owners. Small business owners and lawmakers alike warn the new, uh, that the new rules will subject farmers, ranchers, home builders, and other entrepreneurs to complicated and costly regulations. In fact, as seems to be a trend with the EPA, the agency appears to have downplayed the regulatory and economic impact this rule will have on small businesses. As in is common with federal government top-down approach to regulation, the agency failed to conduct proper outreach, which resulted in a lack of proper input from small business owners. That's why we're here today. This missed opportunity has resulted in poor, short-sighted policies that will inevitably have adverse effects on everyday Americans and do nothing, nothing to provide clean water to our communities and families. At the very least, the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers should rescind the rule until economic impact on businesses, especially small businesses, 
has been de determined as required under the Regulatory Flexibility Act. This administration's track record of ignoring or only paying lip service to the cost-benefit analysis as required by law for new regulatory regimes is not only troubling, it's downright irresponsible. I want to thank my Arizona colleagues, uh, Congressman David Schweikert, Paul Gosar, for organizing this roundtable. And as, as always, it's great to see your bright and smiling face, Congressman Franks. I'm really thankful uh, Lamar Smith came in from Texas. And I, I think you guys think we're part of Texas, don't you? Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, anyway, and Gail, thank you for all your great work. We really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to thank the other panel participants, those that are here to testify today. Your real-world real expertise is critical as we examine the actual impacts of the EPA's proposed rule and take steps to protect our nation's small businesses from more government overregulation and growth-destroying policies. And I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Our next opening statement is from the representative from Arizona's 8th Congressional District, Trent Franks, who is a member of the House Armed Services Committee and the House Judiciary Committee. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I want to certainly thank uh, all of the people here that have come to, to witness this hearing and uh, uh, also to our distinguished panelists. Let me especially express uh, gratitude to all of the people here on the, on the dais. Uh, you know, we, we love every one of you. Uh, I would uh, call out to Lamar Smith for special uh, gratitude for coming all the way uh, from Texas. Uh, you know, uh, I had the privilege of serving on the Judiciary Committee when he was chairman, and I, I don't want to embarrass him, but there's not a finer man in Congress. He's, he's just a truly great man, and we're very fortunate to have him there. And uh, uh, again, I appreciate, you know, I'm in, in the enviable position here uh, in this hearing titled Cleaning Up the Clean Water Act. What a, great, uh, what a great title. I don't know who came up with that, but they should be applauded. Uh, but I'm in the enviable position of having agreed with every phrase that's been spoken here already this morning. So it affords me the opportunity to make my comments fairly brief. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on, on March 25th of this year, the EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers issued a proposed rule to change the scope of water subject to federal jurisdiction under the Clean Water Act. This hearing will, uh, will examine the egregious effects this proposed rule would have on our state. The Clean Water Act limits federal ju jurisdiction to navigable waters. And in 2001 and 2007, the U.S. Supreme Court reaffirmed those limits. But the regulatory structure of the Clean Water Act depends upon the definition of navigable waters. Once a body of water has been determined to be a navigable water of the United States, uh, the permitting requirements of the act are triggered. This proposed rule would, reassert, would assert a Clean Water Act jurisdiction over nearly all areas with any hydrologic connection to downstream navigable waters, including ditches, drainages, ponds, prairie potholes, floodplains, and other seasonally wet areas. This rule will pose a regulatory nightmare for small businesses, our farmers, our construction aggr in, aggr aggregate industries, and our land developers here in Arizona. It represents, ladies and gentlemen, a complete bypassing of Congress and two Supreme Court decisions, and it is yet another prime example of the Obama administration's complete disregard for the Constitution and the rule of law. And with that uh, happy statement, I would look forward to hear from the witnesses and would yield back. Thank you, sir. Our next opening statement will come from Arizona's representative for the 6th Congressional District, Congressman David Schweikert, who is chairman of the Subcommittee of Environment for the Space Science and Technology Committee, which has jurisdiction <coughs> over the EPA. And also Congressman Schweikert uh, is a primary and principal author of the uh, a Reform Act, H.R. 4012, on secret science. Oh. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Paul. And to my fellow members, I hope we continue to tease people from Texas, reminding them that they're Easterners to us. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, somehow that uh, everyone else laughs except for the folks from Texas on that. <laughs> um, one of the reasons we're holding this discussion today is about a month and a half ago, we did a round table. Um, with a bunch of lawyers, and we've done this on other issues, where you bring in folks that specialize in an area, you sit them around a table, 
and you sort of read through the rule and you discuss it. And then you turn to the one really smart person over here and say, how far could you take it as an attorney? Okay, now how would you interpret that? How far do you take it? And what was fascinating was the number of times in this roundtable discussion where someone would say, we think they mean this, but I promise you I could litigate it to say this. And for those of us that live in the desert southwest, you know, where we may only get 14 inches of rain a year, but it all comes on a Tuesday, um, it's, I, when you read through the rule, I'm not sure that the EPA, the rule writers, understand rural Arizona, the desert southwest, how different we manage our water resources. The fact we, in the, the Phoenix area, we recycle every single drop. Um, I'm not going to read the whole opening statement, but I will submit it for the record. But there are a couple points here. The rule states, the agency proposes that other waters, those not fitting in any category previously listed, could be determined to be waters of the United States. Though a case specific showing that other either alone or in a combination with similar situated waters. When you start to read through the way the rule's written, and then you see terms like significant nexus, does that mean the wash behind your house that washes to the Indian Bend Wash that eventually goes to the Dry Salt River, that if the Dry Salt River was running, that would run down to the Gila, and then the Gila eventually runs to the... Terms like significant nexus and how they're defined and how they'll be defined in the section of the rule that allows rather broad litigation over time. Even if we all came to an agreement on what it meant today, heaven knows what it would mean a decade from now. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman. <clears throat> Our final opening statement will uh, be read on behalf of Congressman Ron Barber by his District Director Maricela Solis de Kester. Congressman Ron Barber represents the second congressional district. If you could take the podium, thank you. And is a member of the Armed Services Committee and the House Small Business Co uh, Committee. You'll have to hit the button. Button. Try it again now. There you go. There it is. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Congressman Ron Barber, um, Congressman Ron Barber would like to thank you for hosting today's meeting. This discussion is important to ensuring that all stakeholders are heard from and included in this process, and that is something that the Congressman is very much committed to. The Congressman is monitoring the proposed rule closely and looks forward to working with all of the stakeholders to ensure the best possible outcome. And he sends his regrets for not being able to attend today as he's traveling in district. Thank you very much, and I will submit this for the record. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, that concludes the opening statements from the members and participants on the panel. We will now have uh, two series of panels um, with witnesses that will provide testimony and opening statements and then respond to one question each from members of the panel up here. And the first panel of designated witnesses will be with Governor Mendoza, Mr. Lazy and Ms. Engel. They're all seated, um, and Mr. Johnson. Um, so we will proceed with uh, the governor of the Gila River Indian Community, M Governor Mendoza. If you could proceed with your opening statement and welcome. Good morning. Welcome to the indigenous lands of my ancestors, the Huagam. My name is Gregory Mendoza and I am the governor of the Gila River Indian Community. On behalf of the community, I want to thank Congressman Gosar and Congressman Schweiker for holding this roundtable and for inviting me to speak about this proposed rule concerning the waters of the United States. My community shares many of the same concerns as other tribes, developers, and private landowners regarding the proposed rule. In the name of clarifying the definition of waters of the United States, EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers are in reality seeking to bring new waterways under federal permitting jurisdiction. For this, this means that my community development projects 
that do not require a federal permit today could require one under this proposed rule. This could subject our projects to additional costs and delays exact, exacting federal standards, the possibility of a permit being denied, and the potential for expensive and time-consuming litigation. By far, the most significant impact that this proposed rule could have on my community concerns the community's receipt and conveyance of Central Arizona Project, or CAP, water. This is water that the United States holds in trust for the benefit of my community, and which the community is guaranteed to receive under the Arizona Water Settlements Act of 2004. The, air, the community's cap water allocation travels 250 miles to the reservation and is then conveyed and dispersed through the reservation by a system of canals and irrigation and drainage districts known as the Pima Maricopa Irrigation Project, or PMEP. This is vitally important to my community that the proposed rule does not revoke or modify any of the current Clean Water Act permitting exemptions, exclusions that apply to PMEP or CAP water delivery. These exclusions exempt most, if not all, PMEP's construction and maintenance work from federal permitting. The agencies cannot be allowed to reverse or modify this by rulemaking. If the proposed rule were to include all or parts of the PMEP system as a water of the United States, our efforts to irrigate our tribal lands and utilize cap water could be significantly hampered by additional permitting requirements, costs, delays, and litigation. And the cost of any new regulatory requirements on delivery of water to our community would likely be passed on to the community, making cap water more expensive so that the community could be hit in two ways. We are also concerned about the impacts that the proposed rule could have on our development projects. The community's reservation is approximately 372,000 acres and is crossed by the Gila River, the Salt River, and the Santa Cruz River, as well as numerous washes. We are constantly engaged in economic development, agricultural expansion, and community planning projects that could very well impact waterways and washes that are not jurisdictional today, but could become jurisdictional under this proposed rule. Impacts of this kind could add significant cost and time burden to our very important community projects. This proposed rule also goes against to reduce federal re regulation on tribal lands and to expedite environmental permitting. For example, Congress recently passed the Hearth Act to allow tribes to lease their own tribal lands and implement their own streamlined environmental review process in lieu of federal approvals and reviews. At a time when federal policy is moving f toward reducing federal regulation over Native American tribes, the proposed rule goes in the complete direct opposite direction. As a final point, I would like to touch briefly on another recent circumstance where EPA is seeking to expand its regulatory authority. E EPA is initially initiating a process to control land use and development in the Bristol Bay a region of Alaska by preemptively blocking the Army Corps of Engineers from even considering a Clean Water Act permit for a mining project. 
it does not appear that EPA has ever sought to exercise its Clean Water Act authority so broadly, and doing so could set dangerous precedents, especially when coped with this proposed rule. This precedent could lead EPA to attempt its preemptive veto in other places, such as our reservation. We encourage that the House Committee on Oversight and Government is now investigating EPA's activities with regard to the Bristol Bay project. In closing, I would like to thank you again for this opportunity to testify on this very important matter. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Mendoza. Now, for purposes of questioning the, uh, the witness who just gave a statement, we'll be starting with uh, Congressman Smith, moving to Representative Schweikert, then uh, Senator uh, Griffin, uh, Salmon, Franks, and Gosar. In, in the interest to, uh, to, to make sure everyone has a chance and we don't go over time, we'll do all witness statements then. So uh, we'll move forward to Mr. Jay Johnson, Director of the Central Arizona Project. Uh, we're pleased to be here and thank you, Congressman and Senator, for giving me the opportunity to be here today on behalf of the Central Arizona Project. I am here to uh, answer any questions you may have with regard to CAP, but we do not have a prepared statement this morning. Okay, then uh, at the end of the uh, testimony, they may have some questions for you. Uh, Mr. Michael Lacey, uh, Director of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Uh, thank you. Um, members of Congress, Senator Griffin, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Um, just over a year ago, Governor Jan Brewer instructed then Director Sandy Fabritz Whitney of the Arizona Department of Water Resources to prepare Arizona's Next Century, a strategic vision for water supply sustainability. The vision was published in January 2014 and is designed to provide a solid foundation for Arizona's economic development for its next century. It builds upon the legacy of the leaders that came before us and demonstrates the continued need to invest and develop water supplies to support economic growth and protection of Arizona's unique natural environment that we all cherish. The collective foresight of these visionary leaders has positioned Arizona very well as compared to our neighboring states. Our current successes rely on the development, storage, and transfer of water. Additional water de supply development and transfers will be required to increase water supply resiliency for our current citizens and to meet the needs of a growing Arizona. Specific opportunities and strategies identified in the vision include exploration of in-state water transfers, water supply development or augmentation through revised watershed management practices, rainwater harvesting, stormwater capture, and importation of water supplies from outside of Arizona. EPA's proposed rule may serve to jeopardize the viability and resiliency of Arizona's existing water portfolio and water delivery infrastructure and threaten development of additional water supplies that will be necessary to sustain Arizona's economic development. We are both puzzled and troubled as to why EPA has not worked with the states in this rule development process. Um, that concludes my remarks, and uh, I yield back to the chair. Thank you, Mr. Lacey. Uh, th our next statement comes from Professor Kristen Engel with the University of Arizona. She's the author of an environmental law treatise and uh, is going to provide some information. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Congressman Swikert, Congressman Gosar, honorable members of this committee, uh, my name is Kirsten Engel, and I'm very honored to be asked to testify before you today. In my remarks, I wish to make three points related to the Clean Water Act rulemaking being proposed by the Army Corps of Engineers and the Environmental Protection Agency. First, it's my view the agency should step aside and let Congress address the important question of the proper reach of federal authority over our nation's waters. Second, at a minimum, and this has already been mentioned here today, the Corps at EPA should delay finalizing this rule until the panel examining the scientific soundness of the rule has completed its review and the public has had an opportunity to comment on the panel's findings. Third, because the issues are inextricably related, we've already heard about this from uh, some of the other uh, testifying witnesses, 
The Corps and EPA should, in this rulemaking, clarify the applicability of the Clean Water Act's permitting and treatment requirements to water supply facilities and transfers of water between water bodies meeting the definition of waters of the United States. So allow me to elaborate on each of these three points so that we can better understand their implications generally and for Arizona specifically. Congressional action and not agency action may be what is needed to bring more certainty to this complex area of the law. Mm. The Corps and EPA justify the waters of the United States rulemaking as necessary to clear up the confusion regarding the Act's jurisdiction in the wake of the Supreme Court's decisions in Solid Waste Agency of North Cook County versus U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the Rapinos versus United States case. And these were referred to by Representative S uh, Salmon. This goal is laudable, but it merits noting that both cases were prompted by assertions of federal authority by the agencies themselves. In the Solid Waste Agency case, the court vacated the migratory bird rule, a core and EPA interpretation that brought isolated wetlands within the definition of the waters of the United States. In Rapanos, the court vacated lower court decisions supporting core and EPA jurisdiction over wetlands adjacent to non-navigable tributaries of navigable <coughs> waters. Thus, it appears we are locked in something of a vicious cycle. The Corps and EPA issue regulations that prompt litigation, which then prompts more regulation. To break this cycle, Congress should consider amending the Clean Water Act's broad and very indefinite jurisdictional language and state exactly what waters the American people wish to be subject to federal authority. This will bring greater certainty to regulated parties as well as less litigation. In the absence of a congressional amendment, it is important that the agency's determination of waters of the United States reflect the best science currently available. EPA has submitted its analysis of the connectivity between traditionally navigable waters and other waters to peer review by an external panel of scientists. In doing so, EPA has taken an important step to support its regulation with solid science. Inexplicably, however, the agencies are soliciting public comments on the rule prior to the panel's publication of their findings. EPA should extend the public comment period so that all stakeholders can provide input on the scientific review process. Finally, in the Western United States, as important to the reach of federal authority as the definition of waters of the United States is the question of whether transfers between covered waters are subject to the permitting provisions of the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act requires any addition of pollutants to navigable water to obtain a permit, and in many cases, the discharges are treated to reduce pollutant levels. To the extent movement of water through the canals and aqueducts of western water supply systems constitute under this rule discharges into waters of the United States, they may require permitting and treatment. Nevertheless, this may be unnecessary to the protection of human health and the environment, since water in these systems are, is already being treated prior to being supplied to homes and businesses. In 2008, EPA issued an exemption from the Clean Water Act's permitting requirements for transfers of waters between waters of the United States in the absence of, quote, intervening industrial, municipal, or commercial use. This is an important rule for the West, because regardless of the scope of the waters of the United States, these transfers are exempt under this rule. However, EPA's water transfer rule was recently invalidated by a New York federal district court, a ruling that adds to the mixed response the rule has received in the courts since promulgation. Although this court decision is now being appealed by the western states, including Arizona, and also, interestingly enough, by the EPA, a split between appeals court circuits could eventually trigger a challenge to the rule to the Supreme Court, where its reception is unclear. The bottom line is that the water transfers rule is of immense importance to the West, the rule is in trouble, and in its absence, the effect of the rule being considered today may sweep within core and EPA jurisdiction many parts of Western water transfer systems. That would not be for the benefit of society or the environment. In sum, the scope of the federal jurisdiction under a nation's waters is a complex issue with a complex history of regulation by EPA and the Army Corps of Engineers and responsive rulings by the Supreme Court of the United States. To enhance regulatory certainty in this area, we may need congressional action and not more agency action. In any event, EPA and the Corps should delay finalizing the rule until the scientific review process is complete and should take this opportunity to address clearly the applicability of the Clean Water Act's permit requirements to water transfers. Thank you. 
Thank you, Professor Engel. Now we will go to um, member uh, questions. Each member has a total of five minutes for the entire panel. We start with Congressman Smith. Five minutes. I'll try to be quick. Uh, Governor Mendoza, thank you for your very informative testimony. And I particularly appreciated your specifics when you talked about the adverse impact on the project. You said it was going to add to cost, cause delays, <coughs> permits would be denied, and so forth. In regard to CAP, you said the water would be more expensive. That sounds to me like uh, not much positive is coming out of these regulations when it, you talk about the impact on tribes or uh, others in general. My quick question for you is how do these regulations specifically affect tribal rights? And to the extent they do, maybe you could file suit, but uh, how do they affect tribal rights? Okay. Thank you, Congressman Smith. And, uh, you know, we have the same similar problem with the EPA with regard to the Navajo generating station issue. But with regard to your question, you know, um, with regard to our community, uh, you know, uh, as I've stated before, we have the Pima Maricopa Irrigation Project on our reservation, and it's responsible for the water delivery system. And that particular system is essential to meeting our community's water needs under the Arizona Water Settlements Act and, uh, and for other purposes. You know, the operation and expansion of this very important project has not been traditionally uh, traditionally required the Clean Air Water Act permits and this exemption must be uh, pre preserved, you know, because uh, not only does it impact just that, our particular water delivery system, but it, it may impact some of our other ongoing projects that we have, such as our council just recently approved the construction of new homes for our community members. These homes will require new infrastructure, including electricity, sewer, and stormage drains, which the community will provide. But also on top of that, we, uh, we, we are going to be constructing a new hospital uh, with uh, funds, federally funds that have been allocated for a project called the Southeast Amblicary Care Center near Chandler. These types of developments are very critical to providing services to our member, and they should not be delayed because of federal regulations. Uh, we don't like litigation, sir, but in, in, in order to protect the interests of our community and the ongoing projects that we have, you know, uh, again, you know, uh, we believe that uh, as, a, as a sovereign nation, you know, we have the interest, we have an interest in minimizing federal regulation and federal overreach on our own tribal lands. Governor Mendoza, somehow I think you were ready for that question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank right. you for that response. Uh, Mr. Lacey, you made the good point that there had been no consultation uh, with the uh, federal government. By the way, you're not alone in that regard. I'm not aware of the federal government consulting with any uh, jurisdictions or states or communities that would be adversely impacted. But uh, real quickly, what would be the impact of these proposed regulations on Arizona's water supply? It does jeopardize the operation of um, existing water delivery infrastructure. So we have canals, ditches. Um, it has the potential for um, impacting water users, um, agricultural interests, um, landowners, ranchers. Um, and, and as we're moving forward in, in looking at developing additional supplies, it, it really does um, put some of those plans in, in jeopardy with regards to what um, there's, there's folks that are looking at land modification to um, increase yields off of off of watersheds. Um, also, there's an added benefit of fire resiliency that may come with yeah. some of these activities and um, and we think there's some potential okay. that um, that those activities may be hampered by this rule. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lacey and Professor Engel. Uh, thank you for emphasizing uh, the uh, absence of comment by the Science Advisory Board. As I mentioned in my opening statement, that's not optional. That's required by law, and it was ignored by the EPA. Why they think they can get away with that, I don't know, and why they did not wait to hear what the scientific experts had to say makes me wonder. Are they worried about disagreement, or, or do they just not care? Whatever, there's no good reason for ignoring the law and, re and ignoring the requirement that they consult with the Science Advisory Board. Uh, I appreciated your 
mentioning and emphasizing that these regulations should reflect, you use the word best science or good science, and it, they do not necessarily reflect that. Uh, I have had an ongoing uh, battle with the EPA to try to get them to give the science committee the data they use as the basis for these regulations, uh, not only clean water, but also clean air. And in fact, I was the first uh, science committee uh, chairman in the last 21 years to issue a subpoena directed at the EPA just a few months ago, uh, in fact, to try to get them to show us the data. Uh, what are they afraid of? If the data shows what they say it does, why don't they make it public and allow us to review it and allow independent uh, scientists to review it as well? So basically, I just want to thank you for your statement. Do you have anything to add about the uh, Science Advisory Board or using good data? You're welcome to make an additional comment. Well, I do think it's important. I think it's uh, important to point out EPA has said that it will not finalize the rule until the panel is done with their uh, yes. done with their review. But I think it's important that that review be subject to. I agree. May they never finish their review, then we won't be subjected to the regulations. I don't think. Uh, to the extent I have another 30 seconds, Mr. Johnson, do you want to make any uh, comment on the adverse impact of these proposed regulations on CAP? Uh, certainly, Congressman. There could clearly be some um, del deleterious impacts on the cap being classified as a water of the United States, which certainly looking at the expand expanded definition, particularly that of tributaries, we could be real would be reeled in. Uh, certainly that would expose us to the risk of having to have certain permits, especially under Section 404, the dredge and fill. Uh, provisions if we have any kind of work that has to take place in or around our canal and that specifically draws me back to a couple of years ago when there actually was a, a breach of the canal and while uh, that was shut down for only three weeks and no water was failed to be delivered by the CAP uh, having to acquire a 404 permit could jeopardize that we're talking about money on the one hand but perhaps more importantly time on the other hand and secondly, we could be uh, required uh, to have Section 402 permits, which are the so-called NIPIDES, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permits, for discharging water into a, a water of the United States. And Ms. Engel referred to the water transfer rule, which is currently uh, under litigation, which provides somewhat of a shield from those permits. But the actual impact of the Clean Water Act definition uh, could be extremely problematic if uh, that water transfer rule were to disappear. Uh, we could have to treat water, get permits for not just putting water into Lake Pleasant like we do or, or other areas. Even bringing water into the canal could require that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for your comments too. Thank you. Now, uh, Congressman Schweikert, you have five minutes for the panel. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, I want to walk through a couple of the outliers and make sure I'm understanding some of the discussions we've had with council on this. And Mr. Johnson, let's take first take a look at um, scenarios of CAP. And I'm sure you've already had conversations with legal counsel um, in regards to what could be. Um, feeder canal, where you need to repair it or move it around, does it fall now un under these new definitions? actually did consult with counsel and, and I am counsel actually <coughs> I and uh, I, I wasn't going to disparage you that way yes you know the, the rule is so <coughs> terribly broad you know it's not clear exactly what all may or may not be included within the definition uh, we would look at it as being so broad that it talks about any lined or unlined ditch or canal reels in an awful lot of uh, potential. Now, now, one of the staff we were working with was saying that if this was fully implemented the way they, they could see a time where it could take a year, two years to get your 404 permit. Um, yeah, that you, is that your experience? Is that the world of? It is possible that it could take that long to get a 404 permit. There are certain expedited ways to get a 404 permit, but whether CAP would be able to engage in that, whether we would be able to get what's called a national or regional permit that could perhaps expedite the process, 
certainly unknown. Now, what happens in a situation, this one might be for Mr. Johnson and Mr. Lacey, um, something like Lake Pleasant, where actually in many ways we have a mixing situation. We have, you know, both sort of our natural snowmelt runoff, um, but we also drop our CAP water in there as a depository. Um, does that mixing, does that, doesn't that start to cause uh, uh, an issue? Yes, sir. Uh, we actually take Colorado River water and we transfer it into Lake Pleasant as a storage unit. Uh, without the protection of the water transfers rules, and if we are indeed a water of the United States, we could be subject to permitting and potentially treatment of water that goes from the CAP canal into Lake Pleasant, but also in the reverse. Even though it's on its way to go to a place that may be treated? Yes, sir. Um, Mr. Lacey, uh, when you look particularly at the desert southwest and, you know, somewhat how unique our water and irrigation systems are here, <coughs> do, you, do we have a specific problem in the way the rule makers look at us or don't even look at us and don't understand what we do, how we do it? I mean, I is it just they don't understand the southwest? I, th I think across the board that's... Uh, it's a generalization, but I, I believe that statement is largely true. Um, the unique circumstances we find ourselves in are not often captured in the sort of national rulemaking. Um, professor, um, you've started to touch on it, and it's bounced up here in a couple places. Um, in, in these definitions, and, and I want to walk, and this may be a little bit of the theater of the absurd, but would you walk a scenario with me? Um, and you're in beautiful Tucson, right? I am. Okay, and we'll forgive you for, you know, it's not a sun devil, but it's... I'm very happy to be here. Okay. Welcome to the Grand Imperial State of Maricopa County. For our rural folks, that's really funny. Um, but l l let's take a typical neighborhood, whether it be in Pima County or those, and you have a piece of property and part of your property is in a floodplain. Do you now, does your property now start to fall under this examination? How about if that property also has a wash in it that occasionally runs during um, monsoon season? Does that fall into under here? If it does, um, wouldn't that mean when you want to go in your backyard and plant a Palo Verde tree that you're about to dig into the ground, that you might need a 404 permit? I hesitate to, uh, to speculate. Um, certainly the scope of this rule is extremely broad. So I, 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 that's definitely the case. And for everyone and, and my fellow um, panel members, that's actually where, on, on a personal level, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around, is how much of our life out here in the Southwest, particularly if this rule and over a decade of litigation, which seems to happen where these federal rules get expanded and expanded and expanded through litigation, what will this look like? You know, it may be well intended today, but it doesn't work for those of us that live in the desert Southwest. And with that, I yield back. Four minutes and 55 seconds. <laughs> trying to hit exactly five. <laughs> Congressman Tranks, uh, Franks, you have the uh, floor. You're allowed to. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, one of the things I think that uh, those of us that have the, the privilege of trying to make the law have as also an obligation, and that is f clarity. Um, and if there's anything here that I think is a at issue, it's clarity. Uh, it, it's a Part of the the challenge that you have, of course, is that bureaucrats who have very little um, accountability or any mechanism to hold them accountable not only are able to uh, exploit that lack of clarity, but they're able to inject a lot of arbitrary um, perspectives of their own. So um, under the proposed rule, tributary is uh, broadly defined and includes ditches. Uh, now, do you have concern, first of all, I'll, I'll throw it out to the whole panel. Do, you, do any of you have concerns with ditches being subject to Clean Water Act jurisdiction? Um, Mr. Johnson, I'll start with you first, sir. Uh, before today, sir? Yeah. We would be very comfortable and argue vociferously that the CAP was not a water of the United States and that ditches, as you refer to, uh, would not be 
there would have to be some extreme circumstances to consider that to be a water of the United States. So you think it would be tough even for a bureaucrat to suggest that the CAP is a ditch? Yes, sir. Well, let's, let's, hope, they, let's hope they feel that way. <laughs> it's, it's a water of the United States. Yes, sir. <laughs> Um, uh, Governor Mendoza, any, any thoughts on your part, sir? Thank you, uh, Congressman. And just to remind everyone, uh, the Huagum were the first uh, irrigators. They created the, irrigate modern, uh, the irrigation system that you see in the valley here. My ancestors were, were the f first that were the ones that created that, that system here we have. I wonder what they would think of this discussion. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> But, but again, as your, your, your question with regard to dirt dishes, yes, it does. It does c convey the, that water um, uh, through the dirt ditches, yes. Well, ob obviously, in, in, your, in your position, my greatest concern would be that of clarity, you know, that of, the, of certainty. And can you, uh, 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 I'll leave it to the, we'll just go down the panel here. Can you uh, give me some sense of how the lack of certainty or the lack of clarity uh, affects uh, any area in your particular section or sector? Uh, Congressman Franks, um, we participate with our fellow agencies to um, try to, with our fe fellow nat natural resource agencies, and, and we don't have um, sort of a clear vision amongst us as to as to what this means. So, so we have different interpretations of this from from DEQ and, and Game and Fish, State Land Department, Department of Agriculture, and, and, and the Department of Water Resources. It, it's not something that impacts my agency directly, but it really impacts those that we, um, our water right holders and, and the folks that um, really are the constituency of our agency. So, and, and we've heard a broad spectrum uh, and, and there's not real clarity as to what all this means um, from, from those folks. Well, I don't want to overemphasize a particular point, but Ms. Engel, you were struggling a moment ago. Uh, you said you don't want to speculate. But it really it occurs to me that, that when it comes to trying to um, keep the, you know, to trying to comply with the law, that uh, uh, speculation shouldn't be a big part of it. You shouldn't have to say, well, what in the world does this mean? You know, uh, can, you, can you give me any idea as to what the lack of certainty, how that affects you or how that affects the area that you are of, of most con have the greatest concern with? Well, I specify in environmental law and I have to say I can, uh, I can teach many classes on just this topic of what is the definition of waters of the United States. There's really an awful lot of case law out there and it really truly has been this back and forth between the regulators and between the courts. Uh, as they go back and forth. And that is really the product of the rule here. It is a reflection of a, a fairly uh, old regulation that the Army Corps of Engineers and EPA put out in the 1970s. Uh, and the sort of chipping away at that that has happened uh, through these court decisions. So it's, it's uh, something I, I think of a vicious cycle and it, it definitely creates a lot of legal uncertainty. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just would add here in closing that I think that's the greatest challenge here. Um, you know, we had that little unpleasantness with England over this thing called the rule of law. And uh, the, uh, the notion that people can't understand the law or that they're subject to bureau bureaucratic uh, reinterpretation or, uh, you know, complete obfuscation. I mean, we, we're in a situation now where some of our bureaucrats may start calling drug dealers unlicensed pharmacists. And... Uh, my, my concern here is that there's nothing that people can put their, put their hands on anymore, and it is vitally important for all of us and really in, in a, a host of different areas to, as a people to begin to say we are a, a rule of law, not an arbitrary rule of man, and uh, that to, to suggest that it's in name only um, is, is where we're headed, and uh, I hope we can uh, focus on that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Very good point, sir. Congressman Salmon, you have the floor for five minutes. Oh, well, thank you very much. You know, it's no wonder a lot of us are concerned about uh, trying to analyze what exactly this means. There are some in government that uh, even have a problem understanding what the word is means. So it's, uh, it's clear, that, uh, clear that this could be a problem. Um, Ms. Engel, um, you stated in your testimony that it really is Congress's responsibility to define uh, under the Clean Water Act this, uh, this provision. Are you familiar with the RAINS Act? 
the RAINS Act? Yeah. No, I'm not. Well, let me uh, share it with everybody. Uh, we passed it out of the Congress several months ago, and I think it's one of the single most important pieces of legislation that's gone through uh, Congress in a very, very long time. Uh, unfortunately, it's languishing uh, in uh, Harry Reid's desk. But the RAINS Act basically says this, because the, the problem with good intention laws is always agency overreach. And uh, the devil is always in the rulemaking detail after Congress passes a well-meaning law, whether it be the Endangered Species Act or the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act. Uh, those are all great intentioned uh, pieces of legislation, but the problem always occurs when the rulemaking happens. So the RAINS Act uh, basically says that once Congress passes a law and the agency then promulgates the rules, that the rules then have to come back to Congress for a vote to say, yeah, that's what we meant. Think that would clarify some of this stuff? Uh, I think it might. Um, and uh, I know um, proposals similar to that have been suggested, so I, that's interesting to know. I didn't know that that was a law. It, it's not the law. It, in fact, oh, it's, it not, it's not ah. the law. It did pass the House of Representatives with uh, bipartisan support, uh, I think for the second year in a row, but it's now sitting in Harry Reid's desk uh, because it's one of about 40 jobs bills uh, you know, we get this do-nothing Congress thing all the time. Well, the do-nothing place is the Senate, and they're not moving on a lot of good legislation. They keep it in his drawer because uh, the president doesn't want it on his desk because he doesn't want to have to face a decision. Um, but anyway, that, I think that would go a long way. Governor Mendoza, you, you stated that um, it's going to impact your tribe immensely, or it could impact your tribe. What about other tribes? Yes, um, because like our community – Many tribes are land developers, and we're considered municipal governments and business owners. So yes, it it definitely could. And on top of that, you know, uh, as sovereign nations, uh, all tribes have an interest in minimizing federal regulation and federal overreach on tribal lands. Thank you, Mr. Lacey. Um, does Arizona regulate waters that aren't currently subject to the Clean Water Act? We do. You do? Yes. You want to elaborate on that at all? Well, we regulate groundwater. Okay. Um, there, are water, there is water in canals that, that we regulate that, that are not subject to the Clean Water Act, so the, the water in the Central Arizona Project, by example. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, and under the and it, all panelists, I'd, I'd like your uh, thoughts, and this will be my last question. Under the proposed rule, tributary is broadly defined and includes ditches. Do, do you have any concerns with ditches being sub subject to the Clean Water Act jurisdiction? Start with you, Mr. Johnson. Well, certainly we do. As the tributary is defined, uh, it is a pretty easy argument to say that the CAP is included in that language. So certainly that's a direct interest to us. Governor Mendoza? Yes, uh, that particular, as, as I stated about our ancestors, we were the first to dig the modern day uh, irrigation systems that you see today. Yes, it will help us move that, move our water through. Thank you. Mr. Lacey? Yes, this, the state of Arizona is very concerned about water in ditches being regulated as under the Clean Water Act. Ms. Engel, do you yeah. have any thoughts? I know you have lots of ditches. thoughts, but on this. <laughs> Well, ditches are covered to the extent that they contribute flow to yeah. navigable waters under the Act. So I think that's a very important caveat. Obviously, it, we'll have to see how that is actually implemented. Um, uh, but I, I reiterate that it's very important that this water transfers rule is upheld because I think that does address uh, the water, uh, water supply issue. And finally, I just wanted to say to Ms. Engel, um, I'm sorry that Mr. Schweiker beat up on you about the Sun Devil thing. Uh, I'm a Sun Devil, too, but it's hard not to be a U of A fan after their incredible performance this year in basketball. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Congressman. Senator Griffin, you have five minutes for the panel. Thank you. Go Wildcats. Um, Mr. Lacey, uh, we're involved in, in uh, many water issues, and, and I'm familiar with the study that was done last year or this past, past year. 
And water conservation is very important to the state of Arizona and all of us, whether we're an individual homeowner or a development um, or whether we're in ranching or farming, we all and we have individual wells are all very conscious of the water that we use and so if we're trying to uh, take advantage of the rains that we get when uh, information in the past has said we only save five percent of the rains that we get the rest of it is it evaporates go down hard surface roads and such uh, what impact do you see this rule having on individual water conservation projects that are so important uh, to individual communities and, and to the state? And just to, so I, I, I think we're talking about sort of rainwater harvesting as a, as a water augmentation method. Mm -hmm. um, that typically involves some modification to, to the landscape um, in order to redirect water um, and keep more of it on site then um, and and certainly there's some possibility that those land modification practices um, might fall under the jurisdiction of the Clean Water Act and and be precluded um, there's also the line that we need clarity within our state statutes with regards to what's appropriate and non appropriable water as we sort of look at this issue as well and um, as you know there was a rainwater harvesting um, legislative study committee that would have taken all these issues on that has not yet met but um, so so there's lots of um, I think interest in the topic um, and and we really do need to figure out how um, how significant a, a, a local practice this can become and, ha and how important it will be for us moving forward. I suspect it's, mm -hmm. it's certainly going to be a lot more important as we move forward than it is to us today. So. Yes. Thank you. And Ms. Engel, uh, the importance we, we brushed on was the importance of good blind peer review based on uh, scientific data that we have and uh, cost-benefit analysis. and. Um, facts rather than fiction and facts rather than emotion and so this rule how would you see that it would affect uh, good decisions and making in, in uh, scientific data well I think the process is there I think we just have to be vigilant in uh, uh, commenting and putting pressure on EPA and the Corps of Engineers to make sure that uh, the process is subject to public comment and review. So I think the process has been started, uh, but it, it needs to be finished. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, ma'am. At this point, we are going to recess. No, me. Oh. <laughs> How could I forget my boss, <laughs> Paul Gosar? <laughs> This will be my last day working for him. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman, Patiently waiting. Congressman Gosar, you've been very patient. <laughs> I was thinking of the, the tacos. <laughs> Ms. Engel, um, are you aware of the comment, uh, if Congress won't act, I've got a pen and a phone? It's, it's, a great, it's a great comment. Who is it attributed to? I'm not sure. That would be Barack Obama. Now, he's not so responsible in regards to the EPA. I think that was a Republican that actually built the EPA, and I think that would be Richard Nixon. Okay. President Nixon. But what we've got is we've got a problem with the rulemaking apparatus in regards to administrative law, and we're out of whack. Um, so your comment in regards to should Congress be involved? No, Congress must be involved. Absolutely. No, no dictation other than that. Because when Mr. Johnson was talking about permitting, um, I'm from outside of the great state of Maricopa. So when we get a permit, it's, as Buzz Lightyear would say, to infinity and beyond. And this is about power play. It's going to cost you more, won't it, Mr. Johnson? Uh, it would, yes. How much more do you think that it would cost? It would be difficult to speculate, uh, given the fact that to obtain certain permits, such as Section 404, is much more than just filling out a form and paying a permit fee. There are a lot of uh, ancillary studies that may have to be done to obtain a permit. Are you familiar with the Endangered Species uh, Act? Yes, sir. Do you know how much it actually costs us as, as uh, constituents on average? I don't know the specific number. No. It's huge. You know, uh, Ms. Griffin, would you, can, you know, this be a little different. Uh, you're very involved in our forest health. Uh, 
you know, that's one of the principal reasons why we have the problems with our forest health, is it not? Yeah. You know, because trust is a series of promises kept, and the federal government has, has told us exactly what they're going to do. It's not about if, it's about what they're going to do in that rulemaking process. So, Ms. Engel, I'm going to come back to you. You know, we actually had two court cases, and, and it seems to me like we're going backwards. You know, uh, it constitutionally, was it supposed to be easy to pass a law? No. Absolutely. Mr. Johnson, would you agree? Yes, I would. Uh, Governor Mendoza, would you agree that passing a law is supposed to be a little bit arduous? Mr. Lacey, why is that? <laughs> um, it's, it's by design to create stability for the populace. Very thorough. You want to see all the multiple aspects of jurisdiction and make sure that what Congress passes as a law is germane in its application. And that's why I thank uh, uh, Congressman Salmon for bringing up the RAINS Act. Um, but I think from that standpoint, coming back to those two jurisdictional aspects, they actually define and hinder um, the application of the, the uh, EPA in regards to its <coughs> navigable water jurisdictions, one tri tributary aspects and then along uh, in engaging or in, uh, enlarging the definition through the Migratory Bird Act, if I'm not mistaken, right, Ms. Engel? I'm not quite they sure. They struck down their, their enlargement of the, the process of jurisdiction by those two rulings. Yes, those, those, narrowed, those narrowed the jurisdiction. So it tells me, I guess what it tells me, I mean, I'm a science guy, is it tells me that we're going the wrong way, that this, the court is bringing it back to Congress in regards to the germaneness and, and applicability of what was intended by the law. And so what, this gives me a foundation constitutionally to bring it back towards Congress in regards to the jurisdiction of what it means by navigable water. Okay. Um, Mr. Lacey, you know, the government, you know, the, the proponents of the Clean Water Act are going to say this is all about clean water. You know, this is about that the, the federal government knows better than everybody else. I would say that's absurd. Would you agree with me? Um, yes, we try to do as many things with local control as, as possible in the way that we conduct our business. But, but, but that would be taken that you want dirty water. But that would mean that because you're not, you're not placating to the federal government that you agree with that you want dirty water. Well, again, as, w as we spoke earlier, um, Arizona is a unique environment that, that we believe is best regulated within, within the boundaries of the state with ideas driven locally. I would agree with you. Governor Mendoza, did the EPA ever consult with you? No. Nobody within the government aspect? Nope, and that's the problem. Well, I, I see constitutionally the application uh, for, uh, for dialogue on these acts is, is Congress's oversight, if I'm not mistaken, would it not be? That's correct. So it's a twofold plenary uh, jurisdictional violation versus the tribes. Um, it would be interesting to note that I actually introduced a bill uh, that looked at the trust obligations with the tribes and the federal government uh, to relook at that and that jurisdictional application between Congress and the tribes. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Um, I think that I'm done with my questions, so thank you very, very much. Thank you, and sorry about that, boss. Uh, we are now going to recess for 10 minutes. We'll be back. We have one more panel. And after the second panel concludes, there'll be uh, some time for a, a few public comments as well for those of you who may have some comments to make to the members of Congress. And I understand, Mr. Salmon, Congressman Salmon, you may have to leave early. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. <laughs>